This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora, I'm William Ray. Welcome to Black Sheep, a show all about the shadier side of New Zealand history. Just a heads up, today's show talks quite a lot about religion. I hope it won't offend too many people, but with the subject matter that's sometimes unavoidable. Anyway, on with the show. When does a religion turn into a cult? On May 21, there's going to be a terrific earthquake, way, way greater than anything that the earth has ever experienced, and that'll be the beginning of Judgment Day. And when does a cult turn into a scam? As surely as I'm speaking by the Spirit of God, that is a word for a person right now. That is God penetrating your heart. It's burning on the inside of you, and you need to make a vow of faith of a thousand dollars. Oh, Bob, couldn't you say twenty-five? No, you can't make a thousand-dollar vow of faith. I'm saying in faith. And even if it looks a lot like a scam, is the person behind it a crook? What if they really believe they're doing God's will? I'm not going to try and answer these questions using any current or recent examples. Defamation lawsuits are super expensive. Luckily, you can't defame the dead. So we're free to look at the story of one of the most colourful religious figures in New Zealand history. His name's Arthur Worthington. Well, it's not actually. That was just the alias he was known by in New Zealand. His real name? Well, I'll let Peter Lynham explain. I've done some explorations of the early years of um, of Worthington, when of course he wasn't Worthington. And all that I can see is going back, um, his curious background as Samuel Oakley Crawford, born in 1849, son of a shopkeeper in New York State, and then with a colourful life moving, it would seem, from state to state and from name to name and from wife to wife. Peter Lynham's a professor of history at Massey University. He specialises in religious history. Worthington's one of his favourite subjects. And if that wife-to-wife bit perked up your ears, then brace yourself, because Worthington's MO as a young man was to find eligible, wealthy women, convince them to marry him, then abandon them and take all their money. Worthington did this at least five times in the USA. He's described in wanted posters as an attractive man with steel-blue, greyish and expressive eyes with perfect teeth. Those wanted posters also claim he could shed copious crocodile tears and bleed freely from the lungs whenever the occasion requires, whatever that means. He was also almost absurdly charismatic. I think sheer charm is overwhelming because in many cases he got himself into really quite a jam where the situation was very awkward and he seems to have talked his way out of it in Christchurch where really he should have been hounded out of town earlier than he was. He continued to charm people and to hold on at a point at which you know everybody could see he was a rogue. We'll come back to Christchurch, but first, let's just note that while it's easy to laugh at Worthington's roguish charm and daring exploits, his crimes left real victims. He fathered and abandoned at least three children in the USA, and the women he abandoned often had their lives ruined. The woman who was deserted in the 19th century was in a terrible situation. Uh, because she couldn't remarry, um, because she didn't have a divorce, and indeed divorce was exceptionally hard in that period um, to obtain, especially if one of the if it was a case of desertion, women like that would be in very serious financial straits and might well be regarded ostracised by their community as well. This is where religion comes into the picture. Worthington becomes a faith healer with what's a fairly new movement at the time: the Christian Scientists. Worthington links himself closely to one of the leaders of the movement, Mary Plunkett, who at the time was married to a man called John Plunkett. I think you can probably guess what happens next. He increasingly connected himself to this woman who was sometimes called the high priestess of Christian science. And then dramatically in 1889, um, she believed that a spiritual marriage had been contracted between her and and Arthur Bentley Worthington, and she left her husband, and the couple vanished, causing a sensation in the Christian science movement. What seems crazy about this is that 
her husband, her original husband, seems to have been pretty okay with this, at least to start off with. Yes, but free love and free marriage was one of the themes of a lot of American experimental religion in that period. Um, You remember at the same time that the Mormons were until the 1890s um, practicing multiple marriage, uh, and a lot of colourful movements advocated that the restrictions of Christianity on marriage were just another sign of its out-of-dateness. I'll take a brief aside and point out that Christian science today is very different than it was in the 1800s, so no offence intended to any Christian scientists who might be listening, judging by the notice on the door of the Christian Science Church near my house which reads, Christian science is not the same as Scientology. It's having enough trouble already. Worthington's time with the Christian scientists doesn't last long. Pinkerton's detective agency, the largest private law enforcement organisation in the world at the time, has been set on his trail. In the end, of course, the stories start coming out because there's the trail of damage in Worthington's previous um, life when there are already five women to whom he's been married at various stages and places, and these stories catch up. And this seems to force Worthington and Mary Plunkett out of the country. Yes. Now, here we're on slightly uncertain ground, but all we know is that they quite suddenly um, take ship to London and um, then find their way eventually to Littleton. Arthur Worthington and Mary Plunkett settle in Christchurch in January 1890. They set themselves up preaching Christian science, or at least their sort of version of the religion. The people of Christchurch are quick to take an interest. They're very intrigued by this new approach to religion. And Christchurch had a reputation already at that stage. There were multiple branches of Methodism and Baptists and Brethren and all sorts of odd religions. Christchurch was notorious as a place, despite you know its reputation as an Anglican centre, precisely because Anglicans were the establishment and Anglicans were... just perhaps not as tight or controlled a religion as some, there seemed a lot of space for a lot of exotic religious traditions. Christchurch, again, showing its power to be independent, creative and full of cranks. (laughs) I'm sure they'll thank you for saying that. It's very well attested in the evidence. (laughs) To get a flavour of what Worthington was selling, here's an extract from a book of his lectures. Hang on, I'll need a choir for this. What we call this life is a consciousness of good and evil, representative of both heaven and hell. Heaven is a consciousness of good as the all, of harmony as the real, the at one when man thinks the thought of infinite mind instead of his own beliefs. When listening to the voice of his higher self, to those powers which he possesses as God's reflection, he has gained full consciousness of the truth about himself. He is in heaven, full, perfect, and complete. If, like me, you had a hard time following that, then here's an interpretation from Peter Lynham. So he's taken the Christian um, beliefs and turned them into abstract principles which are intended to elevate humanity to a point where they don't need traditional or conventional forms of religion. They simply live in a kind of abstract fulfilment of the deepest nature of human desire. It sounds very new agey. It is very new agey. I mean, in some respects, Christian science is the exemplary model of that aspiration for a religion of self fulfilment. That self fulfilment part is taken very literally by Arthur Worthington. We don't know exactly how much money he got out of his followers, but it was enough to construct an enormous building, the famous Temple of Truth, which sat on the edge of Latimer Square until it was demolished in 1966. He erected this very grand building with great Greek wooden columns. And it really was a substantial building that could take five or six hundred people. And bear in mind that the cathedral itself wasn't completed at this point. So um, uh, it looked like this was the new substance of religion had already arrived. Must have been a lot of money gone into um, 
net building or that was funded by mortgages. And right next door is the Worthington family home. Yes, a substantial home that was set up next door and it lived in glamour. And there, Worthington and Mary Plunkett lived in, well, some splendour with servants. And this was all paid for, partly, as you say, through mortgages, but the debt wasn't held by the Worthingtons. The debt was certainly not held by the Worthingtons. It's very, very striking that there's not a single risk to them. They they risk nothing of their life. You've got to bear in mind that... Uh, Mary Plunkett, in the separation from her husband, comes away with quite a significant sum of money. And Worthington is clearly spending this money in a pretty lavish lifestyle. Nothing, of course, constrains them in doing this. This is not immoral from their point of view. That you should live it up seemed to him to be the logic of his philosophy. But Arthur Worthington's past comes back to haunt him again. There are plenty of local church ministers in Christchurch who can't stand him. One is a guy called John Hosking, a Methodist, who hosts public lectures and distributes pamphlets which are scathing of what he calls Worthingtonism. Hosking starts by targeting Christian science itself. The movement had been plagued by scandals for its free love attitude. But Hosking hits the mother load when he gets in touch with Pinkerton's detective agency and finds out Worthington himself is a serial bigamist, fraudster and thief. He can scarcely believe his luck to have such information available. And so he goes public um, with this and eventually they're circulating a Pinkerton's uh, uh, wanted pamphlet in which Worthington is pictured in the pamphlet as the wanted man who is this bigamist. This is the same notice which talked about Worthington's perfect teeth and bleeding lungs, by the way. $25 reward for any information that leads to the arrest of Samuel Oakley Crawford. Is wanted on a $4,000 forgery, on an indictment and larceny after trust and for money obtained under false pretenses. Has five living wives and three daughters has a loaded revolver and a vial of alleged poison on his person or near his hand. Has served one sentence of three years, but states that he will not be taken alive. Is devilish and devout by turns, but always suave and sympathetic. You'd think with evidence like that, Worthington's days would be numbered. Nope, he just charms his way through. Yes, he rides it out. I mean, he, he is remarkable. But then, I mean, he was, it wasn't the first time he had been exposed and had been troubled. And I think probably he had a fairly contemptuous view of uh, the colony and its ability to do anything about it. It turns out he's kind of right. There's nothing the authorities can do. The crimes Hosking exposed happened in another country. The New Zealand government actually does attempt to extradite him to the USA a few years later, but the US government seems to think Worthington's more trouble than he's worth and turns them down. He gets away with it for nearly six years. But in the end, Worthington's brought down from within. When Mary Plunkett, his wife, the woman known as the High Priestess of Christian Science, turns against him. The first sign is when she creates an inner circle of women within the temple who she tells to separate from their husbands and live in chastity. As you might imagine, that's a move which makes a lot of men in the movement unhappy. Arthur openly denounces that teaching and a bitter rift opens up between the couple. We can't fully see the inside of this, but I think there were issues about control and access to money. I think in the end, she recognised that she'd been duped by him and I think probably he was showing an interest in other women by this stage. Mary separates from the Temple of Truth. She creates a competing sect, the Sisters of Magdala, and even more damagingly for Worthington, she writes a 7,300-word letter to the Christchurch star. Arthur Worthington has seemed to be a better man every succeeding month. Until 12 weeks ago, when the great temptation to try to be all in all came to him. He yielded, and since then has been enacting the old scenes of falsehood, misrepresentation, and dishonesty which were his habit for many long years. Though he preaches the very truth of God, almost like an angel, as many think, he is at present enacting the part of a wolf in sheep's clothing and needs to be unmasked. The trustees who are liable for the debt put the temple up for auction. Worthington buys it for half of what it costs to build, but he never comes up with the money. And in a move which seems to throw petrol on an already raging fire, he marries again. This is his ninth wife for those keeping count, a woman called Evelyn Jordan. The city's in a complete uproar. 
It is high time that some endeavour was made to clip the wings of that arch humbug Arthur Bentley Worthington, who has been masquerading for so long under the cloak of religion in Christchurch. He has crowds of deluded and infatuated followers, and the government scandalously makes itself a party to this burlesque of religion by authorising Worthington to celebrate marriages made in heaven. Why doesn't Christchurch rise up in its wrath and tar and feather the creature? That's a clipping from The Observer in 1895. By now it's clear there's no way Worthington can just ride the scandal out. It's looking more and more like he's going to be sued by some of his former supporters. And so he announces he needs to go back to the United States for money and vanishes. Months pass with no word. But then news arrives that Worthington's reappeared in Tasmania, apparently attempting to set up another religious movement. A group of about a hundred former supporters band together and write a letter of warning to the authorities in Hobart. We, the undersigned residents of Christchurch, do hereby declare our conviction, arrived at from an observation of his conduct in this city during a period of six years, that Arthur Bentley, alias Worthington, is unfitted socially morally and mentally, to be a leader of any body of people, whether banded together for religious purposes or otherwise. Despite that, in a move which seems completely insane to me, Worthington returns to Christchurch and tries to make a comeback. He arrives in Christchurch, announces he's going to hold a public meeting um, and proceeds to try to draw the scattered followers together. Uh, About 250 people attend, but there is a riot in the street by people who are infuriated by the circumstances. And for the very first time in New Zealand, the Riot Act actually has to be read outside um, the public meeting hall um, in order to disperse the crowd. So literally, reading the Riot Act does mean reading out the act, ordering people to disperse, and then Worthington has to be accompanied back to his hotel and told to get a move on, to get out. The fact that he comes back at all is bizarre. Surely, if he was just a crook, he'd know it was time to move on. Is he desperate? Is it arrogance? Is he a true believer? Whatever the reason, Worthington sees the writing on the wall this time. He leaves New Zealand for good and returns to the United States. He survives a shipwreck en route and tries to return to his old ways, fleecing church congregations. But he's not as successful. People keep uncovering his past and he's repeatedly run out of town. I suppose there's a point at which, if you've got a reputation, your reputation sticks closer to you, and so it becomes harder to move and leave it behind. And eventually, justice (laughs) catches up with him. I can't believe this is the only time he's arrested, but in 1917, he finally gets arrested. Finally, in 1917, isn't that an extraordinary story that it takes so long, considering that the offences had gone back to the 1860s, So he's now actually quite an elderly man when he's he's finally dealt with. Worthington dies in jail. According to one story, he had a heart attack after being confronted by one of his more recent female victims. A bit of poetic justice, perhaps. But why did he do it? I'm tempted to say he might have been a psychopath. He certainly demonstrates some of the characteristics, extreme charisma, a level of cold calculation under pressure, an apparent lack of a moral compass. Peter Lynham has a different theory. He thinks Worthington's a true believer. The well-known feature of Christian science is the power of the will. If we feel diseased, the disease can go away. Uh, And so Christian science has been notoriously associated uh, with people declining to have blood transfusions and declining various forms of, of treatment. And that's, I think, the heart of Worthington that he is a true believer in himself and he's deeply convinced of his own inherent genius which he, unlike everybody else, is willing to release and to free and to make available and the world will be better off for his own aid. It sounds a bit almost like sort of extreme liberalism that like, you know, if everyone follows their innermost desires then there'll be some kind of Balancing, you know, it's a bit like Anne Rand almost. Yes, I think those connections are made, and Anne Rand and the like do draw upon 
this American pragmatic tradition in which inner power and inner strength can in the end change the outward world. I'm just getting into a prophetic vein. Someone with a digestive tract problems, quickly call. There's a miracle for you. Intestinal problems. Someone with similar intestinal problems. We've seen several people being delivered from the cosmic bag. Disability with a child, some type of a learning disability. We've seen many, many children healed. We've seen midgets grow. We've seen arms and legs that stop growing because the growth cells have stopped. I don't make this stuff up. We have thousands of testimonials documented by people's lives. Special thanks to Peter Lynham and Massey University. I know I say this every week, but if you like this podcast, please take the time to rate it on iTunes and share it with your mates. Next week, the story of the man who's often held responsible for starting the bloodiest war in New Zealand history. It's not the weapons, it's not just one or two victories. He's the total leader, the leader that manages war with the economy, with diplomacy, with political success. I don't think you can really point to another chief who did anything on that scale for that long. Black Sheep was written and presented by me, William Ray. It was edited by William Saunders. The executive producer is Tim Watkin. Our voice actors were Adam McCauley, Duncan Smith and Janella Espinas.